That mission was the pinnacle of my career. That is what every Special Forces Green Beret dreams of. He dreams of going into an area on his own, the 12 man ODA, fighting with indigenous troops or militia to defeat bad people. It's, a, it's amazing. Welcome to Combat Story. I'm Ryan Fugit, and I served war zone tours as an Army attack helicopter pilot and CIA officer over a 15 year career. I'm fascinated by the experiences of the elite in combat. On this show, I interview some of the best to understand what combat felt like on their front lines. This is Combat Story. Today we hear a combat story I've been looking forward to for years. As many listeners know, I closely followed the war in Afghanistan immediately following 9 11. And I revered the Green Berets who rode into combat on horseback to take America's fight to the enemy. Today we hear from one of the very few men who was there, one of the horse soldiers, as they've been called, Bob Pennington. Bob spent more than 30 years in the service, much of that with special forces, including kinetic operations in the Gulf War to one of the first teams on the ground in Afghanistan and more. He's a distinguished member of the Special Forces Regiment, basically the Special Forces Hall of Fame, and in the Georgia Military Veterans Hall of Fame. He and his horse soldier teammate, Mark Nooch, have just released a book about their experiences in the days after 9-11, titled Swords of Lightning, Green Beret Horse Soldiers, and America's Response to 9-11. And if his life can't get any better, he and Mark are also principals in the company that produces horse soldier bourbon. I hope you enjoy this inside look into what happened from 9-10 the day before the world changed, through some of the first operations on the ground in Afghanistan. And I hope you enjoy some of Bob's celebrity moments, given his representation in a key role in the movie 12 Strong, as much as I did. Before we dive into this combat story, a quick thanks to the hundreds of listeners who signed up and shared the word about our Trust and Safety Institute. Please keep it up. We've got new training modules on the site, new jobs, and great opportunities for former military, government, and law enforcement, and others looking for a career where you can help people, still take the fight to bad actors, and get paid a big tech salary. Our training courses are free for those transitioning with .mil and .gov emails. Check it out at TrustSafetyInstitute.com, and please share with one other person who's looking for a more meaningful career. And now, back to this incredible combat story. Bob, thanks for taking the time out of your busy schedule right now to share your story with us. Absolutely. It's uh, great to be here with you. Um, we share the same thing. We, we served our country. So it's a pleasure. Yeah. So we'll dive into this. I think there are just a few questions that I normally have not had to ask people because um, of the, the interesting life you've lived. Are you a uh, Bourbon Hall of Famer? Is that accurate? Well, whiskey hall of famer. I put whiskey hall of famer, but the reason, real reason I put that is because one, I love whiskey. I feel like I am a hall of famer. I actually am. I've been inducted into the uh, Georgia military veterans hall of fame. And I'm a member of the distinguished member of the special forces regiment, which is like a hall of fame. So whiskey. So you put them together. (laughs) Yeah. I know. Yeah. Kind of works for me. <laughs> it does. No, no, no. Hey, and I know whiskey plays a big uh, role in your life, as do horses, which we'll talk about. But yes. there's one question. As I was researching you and your life for this interview, yeah. just so you know, I'll I'll take the whiskey over the horses any day. Well, that's we're coming to that. So hold hold that thought. As I was researching, I let my wife know that I was interviewing you, and she goes, "Hey, it says that he got to meet Chris Hemsworth." So her question was. What was that like for you with the 12 strong movie? Uh, he was a nice guy. Um, he was very gracious. Um, but understand that he looked nothing like Mark. So not, had, not, not as attractive as Mark. Not, yeah. Well, okay. We, we can say that. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, we know the real deal. Got it. Got it. <laughs> let's, yeah. let, let's put it this way. So, uh, Mark took a photo with Chris Hemsworth and his family, and, and he would show people, here's my, here's a picture of me and my family. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Of course, I don't... My, of course, my character is Michael Shannon, and yes. uh, nominated for a couple of 
Oscars uh, in his lifetime. Um, he was very down to earth. I, I, you know, because he plays all these character characters in, in all these movies, and then you, you know, he's he gets real, you know, real intense with the, the his his character, especially General Zod on Superman, uh, Man of Steel. Yep. And so, um, but that guy, he was ready to just do everything with me. He even asked me to work out. He goes, man. I know we've been drinking all night, you know, uh, and I go, yeah, I'm not used to this. It was three in the morning. And uh, he goes, let's work out. I said, when? Uh, tomorrow morning. How about, uh, how about eight o'clock? I said, well, how about nine? <laughs> so, <laughs> so we met in the, in the elevator at basically the same time and went to the gym and um, I had some fun with him. Uh, I was in pretty good shape. And so uh, we were throwing some weights around, a lot of dumbbells, 80, 90 pounds on each. Uh, so he had, he backed off a little. He said, uh, he goes, Bob, I love you, man. He goes, but uh, let me, uh, let me back down a little. I said, sure, man. I said, you're hanging tough. <laughs> so, That's awesome. Uh, yeah. Man. It was fun. That's great. Did you do any combatives with him to get him into that mindset? No, no. He was, uh, but overall, he was uh, he was uh, very inquisitive. He asked a lot of questions. He wanted to know um, how I thought about things, and I know we're going to talk about that. You know, yeah, what it felt like to be in the battlefield. What what are what are the things that run through your mind? You know, uh, of course, I I throw out some things like uh, well, idiocy in in some cases, and you probably know what I'm talking about. Because you you take a chance, you look at it, then you realize, but well, what the hell did I just do that for? And um, he looked at me and thought, uh, "You guys are kind of nuts." I said, "Well, no, not necessarily, but uh, yeah, probably in a sense." <laughs> <laughs> Love it. How cool that you got to meet these people. You know what? A, and for them to meet folks like you who are uh, special, obviously for these other reasons. So coming back to whiskey and horses, obviously 12 strong doesn't really uh, speak to the horses. Obviously in the movie, they talk about it and, and the book that's coming out, um, uh, swords of lightning. will speak a bit more about the green beret horse soldiers, but should we assume that you grew up riding horses or was this just something that happened that you just had to adapt for later on? I actually rode quarter horses when I grew up. What is a quarter horse? A quarter horse is a horse that's out in front of Kmart and you throw a quarter in there and you, <laughs> and you get bucked a couple of times. And, uh, hey, it's fun. <laughs> I, actually, I rode a horse a couple of times, but uh, I think I got more training from the quarter horse than I did from the real horse. Those, See, are, more, those are more of the, you know, guide the horse, go in a circle or... A friend of mine had a horse and uh, I rode that a bit, but uh, that's about the, the extent of my training. Yeah. So you didn't grow up out in like the Kentucky countryside riding horses? No, no, no. My, my dad was in the military, so I, I kind of bounced around. I, um, I was born in France, Toulouse, France. Um, wow. Yeah. And um, then we, uh, we moved to Fort Benning, Georgia, and then we went back to uh, we went to Germany and moved, lived there for about four years. Then we moved to Washington State. So by the time I got back to um, uh, Georgia, my, my, what had happened is we're in Washington State. Washington State was the launching pad for Vietnam. It was, um, we got there in 1967, and uh, my dad was prepping to go. And a um, couple of years it was like a year or two and, uh, or no, actually a couple of years. And, um, while we were there, uh, my mom had to go in for surgery. They found something in her lungs and they wanted to check her out and see what's up. And she ended up passing away. And so from there, we moved back to Georgia and I grew up in Georgia and uh, it was funny because I, I had no accent. And the people were laughing at me. And, you don't sound like you're from Georgia. 
but the action started coming back. And because my dad actually, he actually is from Georgia and he rode horses. Ah, interested. I have a picture of him in uniform and uh, he rode horses. So it's kind of cool. Yeah. Full circle. And I shared this with some of the guys at uh, Horse Soldier Bourbon and, you know, the CEO and CEO and uh, Mark and uh, they were just you know, they were shaking their head. Well, it started way back then. I said, yeah, of course. <laughs> what what did your what did your old man do in the service? He uh, he had multiple MOSs. He he started out as a transportation. Um, he was enlisted in transportation. Then he was uh, engineer, uh, combat engineer, twelve Bravo. And then his last job was a that of a um, um, eleven series Intel. Um, and that's, he was supposed to take, um, he was in charge of, he was supposed to be in charge of dogs. He was the first sergeant dogs that were going to be launched, uh, with their, their partners in Vietnam to hunt down bad guys, the Viet, the Viet Cong. And so, um, that was a little different, you know, but when you're an E8, be prepared to pick up something else, you know, another MOS. And so. Um, once my, again, once my mom passed away, the, the, the option was you are going to Vietnam or you going to retire. And he thought, well, I'm not going to leave the boys. And so I'll retire. And yeah. so he went back to Georgia and retired at Fort Stewart. Wow. Yeah. After 23 years. How, how hard was that for him not to go to Vietnam? Did it weigh on him at all? You know, that's, he was never, he never talked too much about that. So I didn't, I didn't really get that information from him. The, um, he was very disciplined. Um, you know, back in Washington, when we moved there in, back in, uh, in 1968, it was funny because that's what actually started my career. Uh, then I took, so. well, I watched a movie called the green berets. That movie has sent many people into the service. And, and, I, and here's the thing. I love John Wayne. I can tell you about all his other movies. But for some reason, that movie catapulted me, you know, it, as, a, as far as a mindset into, I thought this was the coolest thing. These guys are teaching these people how to defend themselves. That's the piece I got. Huh. And that they had this awesome headgear, you know, yeah. and they all seemed to, and if you looked at them, nobody was really big except for Mike Henry, who played Tarzan back in those days. And Mike Henry was this big, stout guy. And uh, other than that, all the guys seemed to be real thin, had this endurance, but were very, very intelligent, could adapt to the situations at hand. And um, seven years old, I'm I'm seeing this and I'm thinking this and it inter- interested me. And so as my, as, um, as my life took me through, you know, back to uh, Georgia where I graduated high school and, uh, and, and then I moved to uh, El Paso, Texas. Uh, my wife actually went into the service. I got married in 1982 and um, there I, um, I went to college, but I still wanted to do this. I still wanted to be a Green Beret. And so while we were, you know, I said, what are you going to do? Are you, are you going to reenlist? And she said, well, you know, not really. I think I'm out. I said, okay, good. Cause I really, I really want to read. I mean, I want to enlist. And she goes, really? I said, yeah, I, I want to do something that I talked about with you several times. And, uh, something that I've dreamed about for years and that's become a green beret. And she just kind of looked at me and went, okay. So, wow. Yeah. So in, so in 1985, I went unassigned ranger because there was no, um, at that time they had stopped uh, uh, the regular troops from going in straight into green beret training. 18 x-ray. Is that it? Yeah. But they, of course, they relaunched that later on, and um, which I thought was 
a good idea. I really did. A relaunch it. A relaunch. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Because we still got those those guys that were were very fit and um, very very intelligent. It's always good to have some of those guys that come from the conventional forces because then they have a lot more expertise, depending on, if, you know, if they're an engineer or uh, infantry or, or whatever. That's, I still love that, too. But um, back then, when I tried to go in, they said, no, the only thing we can do is we can send you to airborne school and we can send you out of Simon Ranger. I said, well, I'll take it. That'll get me into becoming a Green Beret. And so I was an uh, unassigned ranger and went to, um, did airborne school with the 1st Ranger Battalion in, uh, at, the, uh, at Fort Stewart, or uh, uh, Hunter. Dang. It was right by Fort Stewart, and it's part of it. So, so yeah. you started your career out in Ranger Battalion. I did. Uh, mm-hmm. I did not know this. So just before we dive into that, two questions. One, was it odd in the early to mid eighties to have your wife be in the military and you not like, was there any stigma associated with that? Uh, no, not really. I mean, because I worked, I, I, I've never had anyone come up to me and, and say, your wife is in the military yeah. because I had seen that before it was, um, because I, and the other thing it was, is I was going to college at night. And then of course I was working during sure. the day. It was, I was kind of busy. And now if I would have been sitting home and not doing anything and it might look, yeah. might look a little weird, you know? Yeah. yeah, yeah. You're not doing anything. She's <laughs> out there. Your wife's out there in uniform. Yeah. Okay. And, she, and you know, she was, uh, back then she was considered combat arms because she was, uh, a part of the Patriot uh, missile system and cool. the Hawk, yeah, and the Hawk missile system. That was a big deal in the eighties, right? I mean, with it, it the Russian huge. threat. Yep. Yeah, she started out with the Hawk, and uh, then they started the Patriot. And she goes, "Hey, you know, they they're going to launch a new MLS for me. It's called the Patriot missile system." I said, "Well, well, that's cool. Is it? You like it?" She goes, "Well, I don't know yet. I, you know, we'll we'll see how the training goes." Well, she ended up liking it. <laughs> And she finished, yeah, she finished her four years, but it was enough for her. She said, look, I, I'm ready to stay home with the kids. I said, yeah, let's, let's do that. Let's, let's, let's change. Let's switch. Yeah. You let's know? switch it. Yeah. Man. Okay. Yeah. Other question. It sounds like then your dad didn't try to dissuade you or push you into the service. Like you went through college and then found your way there in the end. No, he was. He was very quiet. He didn't say too much. Um, it was um, pretty much I, I, I almost basically raised myself once my mom passed away. And so things that I picked up, of course, besides sports, baseball and football is was running. Mm-hmm. And so I would spend a lot of time just running, almost like the old Forrest Gump. I was <laughs> running. And so I remember there was times where I would run, I don't know, seven, eight miles a day. Just uh, yeah. With maybe one day off the week. And Sundays I usually took off just because I protected that day for myself. I knew what the day stood for. And I just kind of want to re- relax on that day. But the rest of the time it was it was all me and it was all me running. And it wasn't with this green beret dream in mind it was just like that's kind of your day-to-day how you would have been even if you weren't going into the service later yeah yeah and i would yeah. and i would participate in some races and i would do fairly well you know I'd, I'd win a couple i'd come in second or you know but it was um running just was kind of like a getting away it was almost a stress relief in a sense yeah. and, um, and even today I, I ran today after the surgery this is probably my third time running and it's, um, I felt it a little, my big thing, is being, <laughs> my big thing is endurance. You know, you, you, you know, you feel it when you got five bolts in your, or four bolts in your back and a, a disc that's so big, you know, all the scar tissue, but I'll get over it. it just like I got over all the, the, the special forces training that was thrown at me when I was, uh, coming through the, the pipeline, as we say. And circling back to the pipeline, then, if we talk about your time in Ranger Battalion, one thing that I noticed looking at your career, you go, the, you 
eventually find your way to the warrant officer track. Um, I did, yeah. Um, can you tell us, I don't know, maybe did that come up? Did you see something when you were in Ranger Battalion that said, hey, not only do I want to do SF, but I want to go this route, this pretty unique warrant officer route? No, not at all. Not at all. And, and, and here's something else. So I was in the Ranger Battalion for about a year. Um, I hurt my back. And in those days, if you hurt yourself and um, they actually gave you narcotics while you were at the clinic, which they they did for, I didn't ask for it. They, they hit me full of Demerol because my back was just knotted up. And um, so I got out of there after about three days and they said, hey, we're going to make you the company clerk, clerk until your back heals. I said, okay, that sounds good. Well, but to me, they, two weeks later, I had orders shipping me down to the 24th Infantry Division. Uh, and um, which I was not happy. And uh, they said, well, you can come back in six months. I said, okay. So while I was there, I kept having this back pain. And, but my foot was bothering me. And so I realized, I went to the doctor and realized that my back was irritated. Then this was the first time that this has happened. Uh, where, uh, I, uh, that I had back issues and um, went to the doctor and he goes, man, your, your, your foot is, um, you got what we call Morton's neuroma. So your, your, uh, your, your nerve under your foot is, is thin, right? Real thin, like, like the, the tip of that pencil. And then it became about as big as my thumb. Mm. So what it was causing was my foot to roll and it would swell. And then I would change my posture and I would change my running and my walking. And so it aggravated the right side of my back. So that was the first thing. So I, I really couldn't go back in six months. So I had surgery. Then another year, same thing happened to the left foot. Damn. Exactly. And I'm going, I just have bad feet. <laughs> and I'll tell you, there's some guys out there probably that are going to listen to this and go, you know, I never thought of that. Yeah. Never thought I've had bad, I've had bad backs and I never thought about looking at my feet. I, I'm thinking I might be in this boat, Bob. So I'm checking this out <laughs> afterwards because it might explain something. Yeah. yeah. All right. Yeah. And so, so from there I had the, uh, the second surgery that was in uh, about 88. And then I realized that um, even with doing the training and the, the surgeries there, that the conventional army was not for me. It, uh, we were not a good fit because we didn't do a whole lot. And I felt like I was wasting time. And so um, the SF recruiters came by and um, they were, you know, they were talking to some of us and they said, Hey, you know, you guys want to, you want to break, you want to, you want to get away. You want to do these, these job, these great jobs and all these lands and you want to get extra money, TDY and, you know, and I'm going really extra money. Yeah. Well, hell yeah. <laughs> like you already wanted to do it anyway. This is just yeah. crazy. Yeah. yeah. And so uh, my feet started feeling better. My back was really good. Um, and then they make you fill out this questionnaire. And the questionnaire is, do you, do you think you can complete special forces training at the Q course? And I said, well, if my feet hold up. I actually wrote that. Oh. And um, I took the PT test and uh, some other tests that they, they gave me when they, the, the recruiters came. They showed up and they said, all right, man, you're set. You're ready to go to selection. And that was, that was, uh, 1989. That was August. And, uh, off I went to, uh, make a new life for myself and my family. Yeah. So why the war, where did the warrant officer track come in? The warrant officer track came in a few years later. I was, um, of course I, I went through the, the, the SF, uh, the qualification for our selection, got, got, uh, selected, went to the Q course, 
went to the Gulf War, um, started meeting people, um, and uh, I was on the team for three years. Then I took this joint billet, was which was in uh, Las Vegas, Nevada. It was really tough. I'm telling you. <laughs> so, so six years on a team, and then the joint billet, and um, all of a sudden I met this this warrant officer and uh, a great guy, Roy Tolbert, and he goes, Bob, you, you should you should be a warrant officer. Here's Here's what you can do. And then another guy that I knew that we, uh, we were on the uh, special projects team. So I was on it. The first team I was on was on 576. And that was from, that was from 90 to 93. And then I was on the special projects from 93 to 96. And then I did this joint billet from 96 to 99. Well, in that that time frame of 93 to 96, I met another guy named Randy Newright. And he had called me uh, while I was at this joint billet in Las Vegas. And he goes, Bob, hey, man, I, uh, long time, I've talked to you, but I just wanted you to know I went to the board course, something you should think about. And so I have Roy Tolbert, who's a, a, you know, mentor, uh, old guy. And then I had this young guy that I knew telling me to do this. And uh, in 99, I went, you know what? Let me put my packet in. Let me drop my packet and see if I get picked up. Well, I had, at that time, I had pretty much had all the, the things that you needed. I had two MOSs, which was the 18 Bravo weapon sergeant. Uh, I had the um, 18 Fox, which was the Intel operations sergeant. I, I scored 102 on the D lab, which is you only need 85. Um, I had some language training and um, I was pretty fit. The, my only waivers that I needed was my service waivers because the amount of time I had at that point, I had 12.7 years and they, they really wanted um, guys that had less than 10. And I thought, you know, well, that's, it really was set up for other MOSs, not special yeah. forces MOSs, because it takes us time to get all those the things that the command wants, you know, all that, all that extra training. And the joint billet really helped me. Yeah, true. It lot, yeah, it helped me with a lot of planning. Yep. I, I worked with the Air Force. I worked with the, uh, the Navy. Um, uh, Marines didn't want to play with us, uh, you know, so... But it was it was it was good training. So, for people who are listening to this, I've interviewed warrant officers on the aviation side, which I know well. We talked about that. Could you just share a little bit about the role of a warrant officer in the SF community? Um, we've definitely interviewed former enlisted NCO Green Berets yeah. and officers, but uh, uh, commissioned officers. But the, the warrant officer track, you just help explain a little bit about what that's like in the team environment. Yeah, ours is a little different. Um, number one, well, in my day, you went through uh, Rucker. Uh, it was six and a half weeks. Unfortunately, and I'm sure. That was very exciting, to say the least. A lot of car washes. and Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. And, and now we don't do that because we realized it was a waste of our time. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, the car washes. Thanks for throwing that out. It was, it was marvelous. Yeah. <laughs> but, but. So we, we went through Rucker and uh, we had a good class. We had about 13 guys and um, normally the SF guys, they, uh, they come together and we, I don't want to say we, we ruled the Rucker classes, but pretty close, but yeah. But at the end, uh, the guys picked to be the command for the company was uh, I was the actual company first sergeant and uh joe lindsay who's a who was a great warrant that uh and a great friend of mine he was the um he was the company commander and then another sf guy uh patrick mitchell which i love that guy was the xo so you had all sf guys that were running the company of all these MOS. probably better for it yeah well i don't know we were we maybe were, not yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
we we had a little we had a little fun. I mean, you know, but, yeah. But um, so for us, once we once we graduate there, we move on to our own MOS training, which was at Fort Bragg. And from there, when we graduate, we are commanders. Unlike the other warrants. Yep. So we uh, um, a W one comes out of that out of there as an assistant detach, detachment commander. He could also be a detachment commander if they need a, a, a team filled with a commander, and we don't have enough captains. It's happened several times. So you got these guys; they're coming out of this this school, and now they're commanders. Um, and then from there, they move on. Uh, they become um, company operations warrants. So they run the, 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 the operations for the entire company, which is six teams and what we call the B team, which is the headquarters element. And then from there, they move on to the battalion level. And then we have billets that are all over. And we also have our own command chief warrants that run are in place at the group level and several other levels um, around the uh, around the regiment and USASAC, so and SWIG, uh, the Special Warfare Center in school. So there's a, a, a lot of our a lot of our jobs are commanders. It's um, and I, I'm a little different than most warrants because uh, <laughs> I had an interesting trail. Or a journey, I should say. Oh, so yeah. So I was assistant detachment commander, detachment commander, uh, back to assistant detachment commander, company operations warrant, executive officer of the company, which is unheard of. Yeah, these are normally roles that you'd have like a captain or a major in, right? right. Presumably. Okay. Right, and then I moved on to the um, uh, Fort Bragg, which I was. Uh, I went out to Camp McCall, and right there they were. They really called me a command chief warrant officer out there, but I was really a senior warrant officer advisor at that point. And then when my time was up, close to it, uh, I was approached by um, now Major General retired uh, Miguel Carrera, who I thought was a fantastic commander. Um, I really loved what he did at SWIC. He, he did good things in, in trading group. And um, he, um, he said, Bob, I know, I know your time is limited, but uh, I really want you to command this company. I said, what company? He goes, oh, you got to build it. <laughs> so, wow. So myself and a fantastic first sergeant, and I had a couple of 18 Bravos that, uh, that's, that su su supported me and supported the, the company itself. We built uh, the security force weapons uh, our security force assistance weapons course. And this was uh, a foreign weapons course that we would teach conventional forces to come in and push them out in a sense like SF guys, but they would go to a region and actually it would kind of take a load off of us because Green Berets were, you know, we were uh, at that time. Modern, in, yeah, small, small country, set of folks. Yeah, yeah. So you have you have these group of guys that we were training, and they were going out and they were teaching foreign weapons training to these uh, these uh, uh, mil uh, military um, folks in all these other countries. A lot of it was in the Middle East and some in Africa, and so it did take a burden from us. Yeah, yeah. So you know you <laughs> you. You, you, uh, I, I thought I was getting something good. And here I am building the uh, POIs and uh, looking at budgets and scratching my head and, and doing all this. And, uh, but you know, you go out as a company commander, that's, that's the way to go. Yeah. As a warrant. That's cool. That's interesting. Yeah. So it was, uh, it, it was a great journey. I wouldn't trade it. You know, I had, I had a blast. And the, the big part of this was is the men that I commanded or worked for or work with. And that was, we're, we're talking superior men that yeah. uh, they did a hell of a job. So That's I awesome. can't say enough about that. Yeah. <laughs> so, so you mentioned that you 
I mean, you went through training in 89 for this and you somehow made it out of the pipeline to go to the Gulf War. So just before we jump to Afghanistan, can you share what your experience was like in the Gulf War? Were you guys in the thick of it? Uh, it sounds like you were with an ODA at the time. Um, can you t- talk us through what that was like? Yeah, actually, it's that's funny because we were one of the few teams that actually got into firefights. Uh, we a couple of firefights. Uh, and, you know, I know you read about this, that not too many teams or, you know, forces actually got into anything. Uh, and because it was a hundred hour war, basically is what it was. But um, we had the, uh, we went in with the, the 20th Saudi brigade and we had um, the sixth um, Kuwaiti tanks with us. And um, the Kuwaitis were, they were actually pretty good fighters and they were uh, because they wanted to take their homeland back. So, but it was, it was, <laughs> It was interesting because we get this briefing, right? Or, well, you know, we're there for Desert Shield, you know, and I'm, I, I remember the, it's like January 17th and these birds are like <laughs> flying over my head, you know, it's uh, dead of night, you know, and I'm like, holy sh- <laughs> <laughs> it, it is starting. And then you look in the horizon with your nods on your, you your, know, your, your sevens. Uh, and then you, uh, the PBS set, like yeah, old school. Yeah. yeah. Old school school PBS right. And now you start to see the lights, the targets getting hit. And uh, so you're going, okay, this, this is it. And so, Bob, at, sorry, just real quick. I mean, at that time, we hadn't been in combat like that for a while. Like, what was going through your head? Is this, were you a W1 at the time? Or no? The, no, 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 I was enlisted. I, you were enlisted I, still. Okay, yeah. Yeah, I was actually. Uh, That's right. I was an E five. I was a young sergeant on a on a uh, basically a team that it was considered a ghost team because they stood it up, uh, uh, stood it up just for this operation. Okay. Interesting. Because um, at the time, right before that, fifth group had moved from Fort Bragg, North Carolina and took up residence at Fort Campbell. And so they were still in the building process. And so 3rd Battalion, 5th Group, which they assigned me to, was just in that process. And so, you know, I I get there, I get at Campbell. Now, I got there a little late, so they had already deployed, and then I deployed and met up with them. And then uh, while I was there, then we built the team. Got it. Okay. You know, and it, it was a, a seven-man team, and um, I'm like, here we go, man. Yeah. You Sorry. And so you were saying explosions in the distance, it's go oh, yeah. time. Like, what, what went down? Well, they were uh, – it was, it was um, F-17s and uh, F-16s just screaming over, hitting targets left and right. Um, it was a great display. I mean, you – it's amazing. And you know, you're, you know, they're hitting something. They're not missing. And so you're sitting back and going, okay. So your mind is spinning and my mind is thinking, all right, am I, am I, am I getting ready to have someone come over the berm or come at us at that point? Are we just watching the attacks and how long are the, these attacks going to last? Are they, is this our initial, you know, and of course, we get the word. Yeah, that was an uh, initial bombing, <laughs> and it was devastating. That those those next two two days, and um, as we're prepping, we're st- now that was January, and so we're not really going to make our move until a little later. And um, I, I want to say it was February, around February twenty second, or somewhere right around there, and uh, that's when we continue to creep, continue to creep. And we are getting close, close to the border as we're creeping and then preparing the Saudis and, uh, uh, for war. Now you're, it's kind of funny because you're, you're advising this brigade and the commanders, you're about to go into this war. And what they're looking at is, I don't know if I can go fight my brother. Wow. And you're going, well, you know, we'll be right there with you. 
where will you be? We'll, we'll be up front if you want, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> which we did. Okay. <laughs> so we were right up front and we were basically what we call a CST, a coalition support team. And uh, we were prepared to call in close air support and then, of course, advise. So that was my, that was my, yeah. my first time that, you know, the close air support came into, you know, <laughs> came into the thought process. And even then when we were practicing, we actually practiced with A-10s. Um, and this was while we were in the desert. So we, we would bring A-10s in because they loved it. They'd say, oh, hey, man, sure. yeah, hey, man, I want you to come in here and hit this target. You know, of course, they wouldn't shoot, but these A-10s, eh, you know, real slow. <laughs> yeah. And then uh, hit their target. And we would shoot a pin flare out. And they loved that. Because it was, oh, I got, I'm taking a Sam, you know, and they think. And uh, so I think in a sense, we kind of prepared them, but it was also us preparing ourselves yeah. with the radios and uh, talking to them and, and getting those, those um, you know, the, 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 the nine lines, the ingress and egress and, and talking them through targets. So that, that was very helpful for us. Were you guys moving forward with tanks, Bob? Like you... Was that the the Saudi and Kuwaiti contingent? Well, the the Kuwaitis had the tanks, and okay. uh, the company it's the six Kuwaiti companies. I think are yeah, or battalion or whatever it was company, and they had um, they had seventy twos, and they had um, I think they had about eight of them, six or eight, and they actually started. We brought them up forward as we came across, came across the lines. And um, so the, the first engagement we got, we crossed the border and uh, it was, it was dark. It was pitch dark. Now we, we just got this brief that we're told that a lot of us are not going to make it. Now that's the last brief I want to hear anyways. Wow. Yeah. So I look at my buddy, Andy Marshall and I go, I don't know who the hell he's talking to, but he ain't talking to me. I said, I'm making it out of this. And Andy, Andy, of course, from West Virginia goes, you damn right, Bob. I'm right behind you. <laughs> you know? so, but he goes one way and I go another way. Um, and, uh, you know, we cross the border. It's dark and they light the trenches on fire. And uh, the oil trenches. So we, we can't cross the oil trenches. So we have to let them burn out. And um, the flames were huge. They must have been 20 feet high or higher. And at the same time, we are uh, we are getting hit by uh, a lot of small arms fire and, and some rocket fire. And we're, and we're just sitting there. And, and it was, this is that part of, you know, there's some, bo there's boredom in war. And then there's, you know, and then there's idiocy, and then there's this, 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 these certain parts where you're, uh, you're, you're just, you're looking at something in awe, but you, 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 you can't fathom why you're there. And so I'm, I'm sitting there, and I'm watching all this go. You know, these tracers and all this flying around and we're not moving and i'm going uh i asked my team sergeant george i said george uh, i'm gonna sit back here in this chair and go to sleep I, there's nothing i can do i mean you know what are we doing <laughs> he said he goes yeah catch some shut eye we'll, we'll, we'll figure it out so i laid back there and of course we took turns guarding but i laid back and kind of just watch the traces flying by me and uh, hearing the, the rockets hit. And I actually nodded off. It was almost peaceful in a sense. I don't know if you ever found yourself that way. I bet some of the guys, when they hear this, they're going to think the same thing. Yeah. It, it's, there's a peaceful sense to it. And then, of course, the next morning, the, the trenches are, they stop burning. We get the bulldozer pushing through there. So we go through there and then we run into a deliberate minefield and they've got, uh, I think the, uh, the, the, the barbed wire was probably 150 yards deep. 
and uh, it went east and west for, for days. So we brought in the MIG clicks and the MIG clicks. I don't know if you know that weapon system, but. Why don't you it, explain it for folks? Yeah. Just So it, the, the uh, MIG click is a weapon system that is uh, uh, a trailer. And uh, it is uh, a strand of wire with, with um, C4 around the wire. And they shoot this. Well, the trailer has this this like this long pole, and it's all wrapped around here. Then they, and it's it's uh, ignited by a, um, I guess, a rocket, and it shoots in a direction over this this deliberate minefield. And as it hits, then it's detonated, and it clears a path. I mean, it clears a path about 20, 30 yards straight line now this thing was this minefield was so huge that they had to do it twice but once they did it now the whole time guess what we're getting shot at and more rockets and artillery so, <laughs> and then we get through here or we get through the minefield and once we're on the other side we get hit again this time we actually see the end and this time now we're really engaging the end and uh, so I was on the, the turret of 50 cal and uh, an excellent weapon system that is very old. <laughs> and if you and if you handle it right, um, it will make the enemy uh, stand up and uh, surrender quite fast. So we can stop at that one. <laughs> yeah, so just quickly, the, the enemy in this case, were they in vehicles? Um, were you looking at tanks on the other side? They were actually they were actually in bunkers and trenches. So okay. there was, um, I remember um, one trench, I, uh, you know, and my team sergeant said, just, just open up, Bob, and just clear the trench. Okay. So, Man. yeah. And I, then, I, I rarely ask this, Bob, but just out of curiosity, at that point in time, since we had not been in war for so long like this, was there any hesitation on your part when he's like, all right, just go ahead and clear that trench, like pulling the trigger on it? No, my only thing was, is I had the, the Saudi guy, the Saudi commander tell me not to shoot. And the Kuwaiti commander told me to shoot. And so I had these two entities arguing at each other. Of course, we know why the Kuwaiti guy was arguing, the major. And um, we know why the Saudi colonel was arguing, because he didn't, you know, to him, those were his brothers. But um, it, it didn't matter to me at that point. What did matter is that I, I realized at that point that I could face the enemy and do that. What I was amazed at later is my brothers and my family did not realize I can do it because they, they knew a, a softer side of me. Interesting. But the, that, that the, the meeting or facing the enemy in, 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 uh, in that type, type of environment and uh, doing the things you, that you have to do, it, it does change a person. So it, it gave me a sharper edge even though going through the Q course and doing all that, it makes you sharp. It, you know, it prepares you for those actions. But once you get there and you, you execute those actions, then you change. And then you realize, all right, I, I face the enemy. I can do this. No hesitation, no problem. Um, I'm sure there are going to be many more days like this, which there were. I understand your family questioning that did uh, based because they've seen you grow up and they know your demeanor and, and maybe this is out of somewhat out of character that's correct did, did you doubt it at all for yourself knowing how you grew up uh, before that moment you know that's that's funny because i never did and I, I didn't doubt it it was almost an instinct because you know you know um when George looked up at me and, you know, he said, engage, Bob. And I, sure. 
you know, besides the, the, the two officers uh, arguing at that point, it was, uh, for me, it was, you know, moot. Yeah. So. Oh, man. Okay. So what I'd like to do is transition to 9-11. And I know we're going to bypass a lot, but I'm assuming a lot of this is in the book, Bob. So just, uh, you know, if I'm off here, let me know, but people can gather a sure. bit more background there. Sure. I've read a little bit about where you were when 9-11 happened, but I think it'd be great for people to hear. Um, and then, so if you, if you could tell us where you guys were at on 9-11, and some might say that you were fortunate for having the chance to be in the Gulf War and the outset of, not, of our war in Afghanistan. Obviously, yeah. other people who don't come from this lifestyle might say you were unfortunate for having to be in both of them, but I think a lot of people in the military would have loved the opportunity to, to have yeah. had that. Yeah, because it was it, it was two different actions, and um, you know, not the same. I hope I hope what I gave you in the first one that, I mean, that's what you were looking for. Yeah, and, yeah, and the information that uh, I gave you. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, because some sure. people. Yeah. So and I hope people. Some some of the guys listening to this, they, it helps them. I'm sure it will. Yeah. Because I, I I run into that all the time when. I'm selling the whiskey. I get I get so many people that come up to me in tears and actually want to to just open up to me, and it's perfectly fine. It is. Um, I I don't mind talking to them about their issues, whatever their issues are. So, what What do they open up to you about? A lot of times, it is just the um, the loss of of of, of friends and uh battle battle buddies got it yeah and uh you know you'd be surprised that you know they, they talk about a guy that's right next to them or a guy that took their place on the uh, in an aircraft that's always a bad one yeah it's always a bad one you know and and uh i had a guy tell me that the other day and then i, I even get uh uh women that come up to me a, a lot of women that come up to me and, and talk about losing their brother or um losing a family member, an yeah. uncle, and, uh, you know, they, they, it's, it's in a sense, it's a release. It's, it's one of the things I like being a, 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 a part of the horse soldier bourbon and going out and doing the bottle signings and, and things like that. And me, or the whiskey and war stories as well, is that, we get that interaction, but we, we seem to be able to help. Yeah. They, Cause they know you can relate. Like you understand this, you've been through it. Yes. They know they, they hear the story and then they just, they shake their head and then they want to talk and it's like, sure. Yeah. The only problem is, is sometimes I get flooded with people and it's just hard to, <laughs> get everyone in front of me to, to yeah, yeah. To actually talk. So, um, it, it makes total sense. And and then I know we haven't even scratched the surface of the post nine 11. So if you can yeah. kind of talk us through where were you at on nine 11, I think it's a pretty interesting story. And then we'll talk a little bit about you getting on horseback down range. Well, let's talk about, uh, uh, nine 10. Okay. So nine 10, I was the uh, just like the movie um, Twelve Strong. I was the detachment commander. Mark had had left the team. He had gone off uh, to the uh, staff to be the assistant S three uh, operations, and so um, I took over the team. And we had a mission on nine ten, and that was to uh, take three Zodiacs down the Cumberland River near Nashville. And uh, this was a uh, an evening exercise and we loaded the boats up with first battalion guys um, and we dropped them off so that they could they could practice a, a direct action hit in a certain area and so they the guys we dropped off they were doing some reconnaissance and so we uh we took the guys down it was uh very cold the cumberland rivers it flows fast. So it's a, it's a cold river. And if you've never been on a, a Zodiac, uh, an RB seven, that the, the bottom of the, 
Zodiac is um, has aluminum, you know, flooring. And so when that water hits, it radiates and it radiates that, that cold and it's freezing. So even when we're taking those guys down there, you know, they're, they're, you know, they're just laying down and they're going, God, this is a, this is a gold one. <laughs> oh yeah. So I was on the, I was on the, the, the trail boat and we had two other, and I had two other boats in front of me and we took these guys down, we dropped them off and then we made our way back. And as we were making our way back, the fog uh, had, had come, had dropped down. This was like one in the morning. I think so. The fog got real heavy, and like I mean, it was like pea soup. We had a Boston whaler that we used to run in front of us um, to just watch over. That was a, a safety safety. Yes, yeah. and um, as <laughs> we're coming back, the fog is so thick, and uh, as we look up. We see the whaler just fly to the right, and this large barge hits his horn. You know, we almost nailed it. We would have all died. Oh, every one of us would have been sucked under that thing, and we'd have went down and came out of the backside of the, you know, where the rudder and uh, uh, the motors are. Yeah, <laughs> it was not good, and so we decided, hey, let's pull over to the side. Enough is enough. Let's not contend with this. And you know, and we were we were hitting these locks too on the way back, on the oh. way too. So th- there was just time consuming. So we decided, let's just let's just pull up on the bank and let's crash. And uh, of course, that was a rough sleep. Uh, some of the guys took some of the uh, life jackets tied them together and use them as use them as blankets because <laughs> we didn't think we were going to be there all night you know or uh, yeah we we're going to run you know rest overnight yep. so <laughs> oh. we're sitting there going oh my god this will be tough and no food so we had some lickies and chewies and uh so we rest up um we wake up the next morning the fog has has uh dissipated and uh it's 9 11 and we make our way back and we make our way back to a designated area and start loading up the zodiacs and then that's when we heard the the news of the first plane hitting was it like battalion calling you guys no, Letting you know actually, no we actually heard it over a, a regular radio oh jeez and so you know you're sitting there going ah. and uh, team sergeant looks at us and he you know he's he goes that's terrorist attack and we all kind of just look and kind of nod our head and wondering, let's get back. We got to get back. Something's going on and we need to know. And, uh, we're probably, and you know, we're all thinking we're going to war. That's, that's what we actually thought no matter what we're going to war. And so we make our way back and then, uh, then we hear the second aircraft is hit. And so, uh, I think it's in the book. We, uh, there's a line into the gate probably about two miles long. Oh. We're, we're, we're in a, uh, a five ton in a Humvee and the five ton is dragging uh, a trailer with three Zodiac. So we drive down the middle of the road, <laughs> past this two mile long trail of cars, pull up into the, uh, into the, uh, the post, the, the front gate, start moving the barricades and we got this young private uh, to us with his m16 this poor guy yeah what are you doing what are you doing we're, we're going across get back to your post we need to get in there and he goes uh okay oh. <laughs> so, and so we get in there and then of course we get the get the poop about uh, what had happened and then be prepared so and then of course on the 12th September 12th is when we actually hear that we, uh, we are going to be one of the teams picked. So it was that, it was that quick. That, that's great. Um, I'm just thinking through as at least how it's depicted in the movie, of course, 
yeah. kind of uncertain who's going to get the mission. Was it um, yeah. like, what were you guys feeling at that time? Were you like, we got to get this. How are we going to get it? Well, you know, here's the, here's the funny thing. The reason we were picked is we were actually going in for personal recovery. The team had worked extensively in personal recovery, uh, you know, via uh, 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 a long insertion um, by way of rucking to a point or, you know, did we need to jump in? But we had worked on these things very, very extensively. And command knew this. And they said, well, let's pick this team to do this. Let's pick this team to do this. And let's pick this team to do this. And they, and again, they said, hey, be prepared to uh, rescue pilots because we know they have SAMs. Ah, and, yeah. It. And so, we, well, hell yeah, that's, we've done that before. We, we're ready for that. And so the, the 13th, I think it was the 13th or 14th, we started going to the range and we started working on uh, what we call Australian peels. What's yeah. that? What's an Australian peel? The ones where you just guys just go in front and they're laying down uh, a press of fire or a suppress of fire or I'm going back, laying down suppress fire in retrograde, things Got like it. that. So things that we wanted to do to protect the pilot. And then we would have a guy oh, yeah. to be the pilot. And then the movement itself, we practiced on, um, uh, you know, what to do with that pilot to make sure we had the right pilot and uh, authentication mm -hmm. uh, terms and things like that. So those are the things we worked on. And then we read, we started reading books on Afghanistan. And that's kind of funny because we started, as we were reading these books, now remember, th there was no intel really in that area. And so we're reading, uh, we're reading library books and magazines and National, Ge <laughs> National Geographic, probably. National yeah. Geographic, yeah. And we're reading, uh, we're reading this crap, and then uh, you know we're pulling out maps, and we're, we're it's funny we pull out the maps, we all look down at the map and go, "Holy crap! No wonder the Russians got this shit beat out. <laughs> this is horrible. The terrain is just a mess." Yeah, and. Um, you know, we were we were thinking. You know, if, if pilots go down, is is just getting to them would be, you know, horrible. Yeah. And so those are the things we thought about. But the big thing was is the continuous reading we did, and uh, and every team member read, and then we made sure that we were cross training at the same time, and we were getting um, as much equipment as we could during this time frame, and then think about it. From that point to 5 October, we launched. Now, what's never said is, or talked about is, prior to that 5 October, we had three false launches. So you go up to your wife and you go, okay, I'm leaving, can you take me to, yeah. And then you go up to the team room, and you're waiting. Up, oh, plane's not going to make it. Cancel. Uh, they said they're going. They can probably make it tomorrow. Uh, so you call your wife back and go. Come get me. Come get me. I'm, I'm not leaving. And so we did this three times. And I remember my wife looking at me, going, "You need to go, or, or you need to stay in the team room because I'm exhausted." And I went. Yeah, and and so was a lot of the other wives. You know, it was good to have those couple of days, but they were getting exhausted over this. Yeah. And so finally, on the fifth, we launched, and uh, we hit Karshikanabad on October seventh, and uh, started setting up our. There was there was nothing there. There was the the one sixtieth were there, and they had these old they had these uh bunkers that they used to put the birds in and, and work on them and things like that and but there was no tents and so we were we got there and looked around and the hell are we sleeping <laughs> so, where, where is this bob this is uh karshi Kanabat, which uh, we call k2 in okay. uzbekistan Jeez. uzbekistan and that's where we launched from that was our staging area yeah and so here we are we're building tents you know and the guys are coming by and going 
uh, who are you guys? Uh, we're just tent builders. <laughs> <laughs> and we probably built about three or four tents because we thought, hey, let's build some more. Maybe some guys will come in. They need tents too. So we just get building tents. In the same time, we were studying. And um, then it was um, a short time after that, just a couple of days, that they came up to us and told us that, um, hey, your mission is canceled. The Air Force is going to pick up the, the PR piece. And then, you know, we kind of thought about it. We were a little angry, but then we thought about it and said, you know, PJs, that's that's their job. Anyway. That's what they do. Yeah. That's what they do. Yeah. So, and then uh, after that, we just continue to study. We continue to train. Um, you know, uh, back in 2000, we uh, we went to Uzbekistan, Uzbekistan and we trained uh, the, the uh, company of, of uh, airborne uh, guys. Uh, and those guys were fantastic, but it gave us it gave us an idea of what what we may face or what we may run into. And so this was in the command's head too. So anyways, we, no mission, you're sitting there. A team gets tasked. I won't, I won't divulge the team number, but they get tasked to conduct our mission, the going in and linking up with Dostum. And uh, they brief then Colonel Molana and um, one of the uh, agency uh, directors. And they, uh, they asked some questions and the questions did not get answered the correct way. And so Colonel Mulholland says, all right, I, I, you guys aren't prepared for this mission. And he said, find me somebody else. And some of the staff already knew what we were doing and also knew the team itself. They said, well, we got nine, five here. You know, and those guys have been, all over it right now. They're ready to go to planning. And so they actually came up to us and said, hey, can you guys plan in 48 hours? Now, planning for an SF team is 96 hours to gather as much information as you can. Ours was 48 hours. We got two pages and a half up order. They laid it in front of us and said, plan off of that, which as they left, we all laughed, but then in, in a sense, we said, let's get to work. All right. We got 48 hours. And uh, I guess you could say the rest is, uh, is history. Before and we get into the history, a couple of things. <laughs> when you talk about how you guys were constantly studying, yeah. is that, I don't know if that would be the case for every conventional soldier or maybe even every SF team. Was that yourself or a commander saying, Hey guys, we got to study up on this. Or is that just intrinsic in people who go to special forces? Like we have to get ready for this. This is what you do. It, it usually is for every SF team, but I think we took it to another level. And, and I can tell you why the, uh, the average age of our team members was 32 of the 12, 10 were married. So a little older, a little more mature is what we're saying. Yeah. And then of those, of those 10, uh, eight had kids. So there was, um, you know, children. And so we had a very, very mature team. We had uh, a lot of senior guys. We had five guys that had been into combat besides myself. So we had experienced, and those guys, the other guys that had been into combat, I know what they did because a few of them were next to me and they engaged in uh, the enemy in Somalia and in the first Gulf War. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So that, that was no joke. And so, you know, you, you get these guys and I tell you, we were, we were very lucky, but very blessed to have that, that unity, that, and that team. It is uh it's by far the best team I'd ever been associated with. And, you know, I, and I've been on good teams. It's, 
And I and I would have put that team up against anybody, to be honest with you. I mean, that's that's just me. Yeah. So, but it, I that was the strength of the team. And so when we briefed, you know, you're briefing with maturity, you know, and you're and you're saying, hey, sir, this this is what we have. And when the, when when questions came out, uh, especially on the the what we call the EPA, the Evasion Plan of Action, in case something happens. That's the plan. What happens when you, uh, you know, in the, they used to they used to teach on the abort criteria that if you lost, yeah, you know, if you if you lost half the team, then you 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 can't. And so our 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 abort criteria was, uh, sir, if we got one guy that's left, he's going to continue the mission. Love it. And the eyes got you know the eyes are <laughs> big. They're like send these guys in. Yeah. And yeah. so okay. All right. Hey, this is the team. You guys go in and have some fun. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, what's our <laughs> call, call us what, if you need anything? What's our what's our mode of transportation? Uh, well, they're probably going to have vehicles. Um, uh, maybe uh, I don't know. Maybe some uh, ATVs or something like that. All right, we're in. Perfect. <laughs> it's perfect. <laughs> so, had you? That's what I wanted to ask next. Had you done horseback like training? at any point with SF? Cause I know you guys do some crazy training. Maybe this came up before you deployed. No, like you're going no, flat. <laughs> no, no. Wow. And, and you know, what's amazing is in the old days, they did do horse, mm -hmm. did do horse training. Yeah, uh, the last, the, um, another thing with this is the, the, the last, um, I think the last Calvary uh, attack or raid was in 1942 in the Philippines. Back then, think about that. Yep. So that's just nuts. And then, and then, like I say, the, um, there was a point back in the eighties, they, they did mule training and they did some horse training and then they got away from it. And, you know, I, I still don't know why they did. They, this is something they should have continued, especially in the jungle. And where you guys operate, where SF, I mean, you could be anywhere, right? Mountains, as we found out. Yeah, that's, that's right. And, and the goat trails were, Perfect for us. And a matter of fact, the um, because that was our main mode of transportation, we had the ability to maneuver throughout that battlefield on those goat trails, and and we're talking uh, maybe a foot to eighteen inches. Across. And so, yeah. And I tell you, if you went over the side, that's it. That's cancel, it. cancel Christmas. Yeah, you're done. Damn. Yep. So. So when I just quick admission before we jump into what actually happened as you go in, I was a senior in college in 01 when this happened. I was in ROTC getting ready to go in the military. I was in DC and I obviously the attacks, Pentagon gets hit. I remember all that. I used to, t I used to like get the Washington post every morning and follow what you guys were doing. And I plot it myself, like just trying to figure out where y'all were. And I just remember reading about these green berets on horses. And I was like, this is the coolest thing I've <laughs> ever heard. I had already selected aviation. And I was like, I don't know if I can go aviation. The stuff they're doing sounds like it should be in a book. <laughs> it just, so I'm, a, I'm only slightly away from a fanboy in this regard. And part of the reason, like when I started this podcast 70 episodes ago, I always wanted to talk to one of you guys who was down there uh, downrange. So I'm so thankful for this. Bob, could you just talk to us about what it was like when you first got in there, like down in Afghanistan and actually operating? Maybe the first time you're in a in some type of engagement. Yeah, I mean the you know, well, just getting in was an engagement in itself. The uh and you know the the, the biggest part of a mission and and when I used to brief this to the guys in the Q course was just getting in the infiltration itself, being successful and landing on the ground. And, uh, ours was, uh, ours was a little tough. And, uh, I think we got shot at a couple of times. Um, we had Al Mack with us who was flying and, um, the weather was so bad. Now imagine we're supposed to have two Chinooks, two CH 47s split team concept because if one team did go down, we had the other. One. Okay. Two Chinooks were not available. So we crammed everybody in one. So 
the next big thing was as we're cramming everybody in one, they're going, Hey, there's a, there's a weight limit. Um, and they're, they're looking at us going, you need to get rid of some stuff. And of course me, I'm laughing going, let's get rid of that Kevlar. I hate that thing. here. <laughs> we throw the Kevlar out. <laughs> What's next? Well, let's throw the body armor. Yeah. Because now we're fighting like them. You know what? That may build more rapport. And it did. And then there's other things we threw out, digital cameras and things. I wish we'd have kept the digital camera now because there's there's not enough pictures that the team itself took of the team. Yeah. And so we but we threw all these things out and um and then of course we crammed into there. We got, got a little money with us, you know, taken to the general. <laughs> and uh yeah, make him happy. And uh uh, I remember Paul Evans, the team sergeant. He looks, he looks at everybody and goes, "Remember this, guys. If we go down, save that kit bag. We got to save that money. <laughs> that may get us out." <laughs> and I'm like, "Yeah, probably." And so we we go in, we fly in, and uh, we have two DAPs with us: the direct uh, action penetrating. You know them. The, so these are Blackhawks that are going out ahead yep. of you guys, 160th birds yep. leading the way. They're leading the way. That's our armament. And uh, weather's so bad, these guys got to turn back. And so now no escort when we're flying. In. So we get, uh, I know we get shot at a couple of times, but uh, the weather itself is bad, we're bouncing all over the place. Um, it's cold. It's, it's cold. And uh, I just want to hit the ground. I want to be successful, hit the ground and hit it in the right spot. And then I know everyone in that bird, the one thing they're thinking is, are we going to be at the right spot? Is the right person going to greet us? So this is running through everyone's mind because if it's, if it's not the right person, then we'll be in a shit storm. Right, the right, uh, like Northern Alliance commander at the time, and and the CIA. Okay, yeah, our, our agency partners, which yep. were were wonderful. We had a great team with us, fantastic team. Yeah, those guys. Were and so, good. and so we hit the ground, and it's it's just like you know when you train, uh, you always do this training. You come in on a, a a bird, and the bird drops you. And then the bird lands or takes off. And then all of a sudden, you know, you're doing your, your seals where you're, you know, sight and ear and listening and all these other things. And yeah, and you just watch it. You just watch. It's all quiet. The bird's already gone. Now. And you just wait. And you're thinking, are we in the right spot? Where did he drop us? You can't trust pilots. <laughs> <laughs> and he was off he was off uh, but because he had brown out so but he was not off that bad he was yeah. it was only a half a mile and so we're just sitting there waiting and waiting and waiting and finally we see someone walking towards us and i'm looking and i'm thinking because mark and i are in the, the, the middle of the, the perimeter and we're looking and, and paul too we're looking and going the heck is that? It looks like the sand people coming at us, you know, from Star Wars. Star Wars. <laughs> these little guys, you know, with these long robes. I'm going, holy crap, man. <laughs> it's real. And these guys come up to us, and the agency guy comes up to us and he greets us. And he says, Come on, man. You know, he goes, You're a little off of it. No problem. Let's get into the let's get into the campsite or the base camp, which we aptly named uh the Alamo, which uh I will Ominous. Say, which I will say that uh, um, Colonel Mulholland, Mulholland uh, asked us, uh, can you guys change that name? <laughs> we said, sir, it's already in all the outlook. Uh, uh, we'll just have to stay with it. He, yeah. goes, he just shook his head. He goes, yeah, not a good name. No. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. so you got to throw in a little comedy while you're doing this. That's stuff. right. Just just out of, like, I interviewed Daryl Utt, who's a long time uh, Green Beret, who was telling me about Operation Ugly Baby, and the naming has a lot to do with bad things that go down. So yeah. the Alamo is not a great one. Yeah, there you, there you go. And so um, we uh, we make our way into the base camp. We set up. We get a, a 
little bit of a night's rest. Um, um, it was kind of adventurous for me as I laid down and felt a rat running across my head a couple of times. Right. So, he was a big one too. So every time I jump up and go, it's a rat, kill him. <laughs> Wait, no, don't shoot yet. <laughs> We're all in this. I said, Wait a minute. And uh, so he was running all over the place. And so the next morning we wake up eight o'clock and there's a good picture of myself and Mark and, uh, and Will Summers, the uh, junior combo guy. And um, who works with horse soldier bourbon now with us. And um, we wake up and uh, share a cup of coffee, get some food in us. And they, uh, one of the guys approaches us and says, uh, Hey, look, Dustin's on his way. I'm like, cool. And so we kind of walk out front of this, out of this wall base camp and look over. And uh, he has sent forth a reconnaissance, about 30 riders. I mean, he's, this guy is tactically sound. He's not messing around. Yeah. He's not messing he's around seen this before. Yeah. The, these riders come in real hard, fast. They spread out, you know, take the flanks, the front. He comes in right behind. We'd heard all this information or this intelligence that we gathered. The information that we got was that he was uh, suffering from diabetes. He walked with a limp. He was an aging man. He was decrepit. Um, and, uh, you know, we're all going, uh, okay, well, I don't know what this guy can do. Or are we just fighting this on our own? And sure enough, this guy rides in. He looks like Santa Claus. He's jolly. He jumps off his horse. He greets us like that. Says some stuff in, um, you know, posture and uh, walks over to us, shakes our hands. You know, we look. He says, are you ready to go to war? And we go, what are we waiting on? And so he takes us to this little berm, which I have a great shot of that. Takes us to this little berm. He throws out his map, just like Patton, because he was trained by the Russians. And he fought with the Mujahideen. And so he throws this great big map out. It's got a, a phase lines, um, uh, approaches uh he's got oh wow it, it, it's everything he, he's he's got the the taliban uh, um symbols and uh we look down and get, uh, i look at you know i look up at mark and go hell this guy's set man all we got to do is see what he wants to do when he wants to do it and advise him you know what's right or wrong and what our capabilities are and let us get into the fight that's the you know that's what we were kind of worried about is you know how far would he let us go and so uh he briefs his plan it looks pretty good there's a few things that we look at that we kind of think about um that's the flanks um how we're going to guard the flanks he's he's got a great he had a great intelligence network too because they were they were stationed out at at post that um, actually were feeding in information of where the main Taliban uh, enemy strongholds were. But at the same time, we were looking at things and going, all right, got it. We see the approach or the, uh, the maneuvers, avenues of approach. Um, we still got to look at the flanks and we need to protect our sides. So we, uh, we asked him for 12 horses. And he goes, I only have three. So, uh, well, we don't work that way. <laughs> 12 man ODA. And he goes, I, am, I only have three. And then Mark and I were talking and Paul and so at least get six because then we do split team. Bob takes the B on uh, in our B section and you take the, the uh, A section. Okay, let's do that. We need six horses. Uh, okay, I can give you six horses. Uh so Mark and the other five guys, they ride off of Dawson to his CP, and then we stay back, we cover uh, some uh, resupply operations in the next couple of days, and then uh, kind of just prepare ourselves for a movement up there too, which we did a couple of days later. So by then, once we all meet up, we, uh, 
we see the operations and we we see we understand there's there's more that can be done at that location and then we decide that we need this we need to take a team a cell a three man cell this is the first cell going out and uh three studs absolutely Andy, Andy Marshall's leading this cell and uh, Bill Bennett is there too, which we lost in Iraq and Steve Cochran as well. And so we push these guys out and they go way, way out West. But from there, their advantage into the Valley is so crystal clear. They can call in close air support and just annihilate everything that's coming through that valley while we reposition ourselves and break down into further cells. And so basically what we did is we went from two 12 man, or uh, two uh, six man cells, our elements, as we say, our sections, sections elements. And then we went down to four three man cells. Can I ask you something real quick, Bob? Yeah. In, the, in that moment, Obviously, the kickoff to this whole war, you guys had had to be thirsty to get at this enemy. Were there any egos that came up within a team like, like that in that ODA of like, I need to be on that cell. Don't put me back. No, here. no, no, because we picked the cells and, and it was um, we picked the cells by um, what we thought were the the, uh, the leaders and the, the men within that cell that could support wherever that cell was positioned. Now, because that first cell was so far out, we knew they had to have a medic. That was Bill. We also knew that Andy Marshall was so capable and he was the intelligence sergeant, so one of the, the key leaders of the team, that he would gather information, but also be tactically sound to look at what he thought the enemy was doing and then relay that information back to us. Cause you know how the S2 works a lot. We work off of, uh, you know, a lot of people say, you know, give me the facts. Yeah, that's fine. But what I want is I want you to give me your assumptions. I want you to tell me what you think the enemy is going to do based off of the facts that you've received. That's what I want. So if you tell me that the enemy is going to outflank us on the East side or the, or come down from the north. I want to hear that. I don't want to hear all the other shit that everyone yeah. else tells you. And so that was perfect for us. And then, of course, Coffin was a um, he was a weapon sergeant, and he was uh, very capable of, you know, gathering uh, uh, foreign weapons off the field if these guys had to uh, break and run. And, yeah, and Andy was the same. So it was a, and he was senior. All these guys were senior. So that was another reason. So we sent three E7s out. Yeah. Yeah. Three SF E7s. And so like the bottom line, no egos here. It's just like no whatever's egos. best for this operation, we're going to go do it, which is, I yeah. think, what everybody would assume. You just never know. So yeah. Yeah. And 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 I, I understand that question, but it, you know, it's it's uh hey guys, we're gonna we're send we're gonna send you out. You guys okay with that? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Whatever you need. Okay. Almost like the movie. Mm -hmm. you know? All right, they go out. We come back. We re we uh, we come down the mountain. The CP. We we execute our first um, uh, area command meeting, bringing all the factions together, and and letting them know, hey, we've got to fight for the uh, fight this common enemy, and we need all the factions to come in. So we ended up building an army of about fifteen hundred to over five thousand. 3,000 of cavalry and the rest infantry. Now, while Mark and his guys were up there first, that is when they started calling in the first close air support. And that is when Dostum didn't want them to get too close to the enemy. He feared that they would get killed. And he actually said, I can't afford to lose you guys. I can afford to lose 500 of my own men before I lose one of you guys. Oh, he didn't want your ODA folks getting too close. That's right. Got it. Right. Okay. Yeah. And it, it, because his fear was that if something happened to us, that we would be pulled out. We assured him that that was not the case. We were there for the fight. 
And it didn't matter how many of us went down anyways. We were still there for the fight. And then he accepted this slowly, but accepted it. And then once he saw that as we were closer to the enemy, we could call effective close air support. And so, you know, you're advising, you're calling in close air support, and now, now you're just, you're, you're smoking targets. You're just absolutely just, it's like game on. Yeah. And then we send the other guys out. It's more game on. But those guys are actually buying us time. That sale bought us time as we came down, regrouped, got the, made the area command meetings, and then we sent another sale out. And they went um, uh, northeast. Um, and that was the team sergeant. That was Paul and his guys. And he had a, a weapon sergeant with him, but he also had, um, at that time, we had two Air Force guys that came in on us. And so he had a, a CCD guy that, that went out. And so those guys covered that portion. And then, of course, I broke down with my cell, and then we took a, a bunch of young guys. Oh, they were like, they were E6s, but wow, did they do a hell of a job. But I always point out that if you look at the battlefield, it's emotional for me. Because in what way? Yeah. In what way? Because it's like it was just like saving Private Ryan or uh, not saving Private Ryan, Band of Brothers. And in Band of Brothers, they do the Brie Corps manner. And how they hit the guns. And now it's in West Point. Yeah. Yeah. We did basically the same thing. We actually had our cells in an L-shaped ambush. And we were hitting the enemy just constantly. And as we were hitting them, we were on the move. And we were moving through the valley. On so horses now, still. On horses. And, yeah. now, and now this, that piece, that piece of tactics is now being taught at the Joint Special Operations University. And the, the, way, we, the way we set up, the way we position our men, and the way we uh, hit the enemy, how we hit them, and then our movement through the valley, gaining the high ground on the horses. And we also had John Deers that came in. And then continually funneling into the, uh, the Bolton Valley. And then straight up and in, in capturing and liberating Mazar Shari. I mean, this has to be in your mind, I would imagine, like this is what you signed up for. You're you're out ahead of everyone else, completely foreign place. You've mobilized, you've like three X'd the military, oh, yeah. the locals. You got close air support coming in. I mean, this had to have been phenomenal in your mind, I would yeah, imagine. Yeah. I, I, let me tell you, we the team itself called in 300 sorties. God. When, when, when I say that to the, the air crews, they go, holy crap. You know, when you say it to a regular infantry guy, or they just look at you and go, huh, because they don't really understand. But 300 sorties means each sortie came in with, with armament, and they dropped something. It got, to be, it got to be where those guys were racked and stacked, and they knew, hey, we're going to, like, Hey, today we're going to go see Tiger Zero Two because <laughs> they can't wait to use us. <laughs> you know, it's like, <laughs> and you're and you're going, uh, hey, we got uh, we got some B fifty twos online. Um, uh, I think behind that we've got some F F uh, F sixteens too. They want to come in. Uh, what's it, what's after that? Okay, and so you're sitting there, and the guy and these birds are coming in constantly, and they're going back. And remember this too. The fast movers that take off from the aircraft carriers, they can't land with their armament. So they're very happy to drop their armament on a target. <laughs> Any pilot who's got armament on doesn't want to land with the armament oh, still no. on. So oh, like no. that just gave them an even greater incentive to get rid of that stuff. Oh, no. And then if you're you're talking, and, and as soon as we got them below hard deck, which was that, you know, that's that, that, that point to where the, the safe zone for them um above that as soon as we got them to drop below that where they can actually see 
what targets we were talking about, and then we could laze those targets or talk them in. It it was um, it was devastating. I can't say enough for those air crews coming in, and especially those B fifty two bombers. You know that that was my favorite aircraft. They could come in, they could loiter for hours, and then and then drop their payload, go back. They came out of uh, Diego Garcia. Oh, geez. Yeah. 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 That's a long trip. Went back there, got their rest, sent other planes back up. And this was constant, you know, and the guys on the aircraft carriers just coming in night and day. So it was. Um, but again, if you if you think about it and, th- and that's why, you know, I get emotional about it is is the, the sales themselves spread out like that on their own at some points calling in their own resupply. Yep. I did a lot of the resupply. Um, I also called in kill boxes. Um, and the reason for that is the flanks. I, I, I wanted the flanks protected, especially on the West. What's a, when you say kill box, can you explain for people what you mean by that? Yeah. Kill boxes. They, you, uh, the air force has them, um, and they, they write it up on a, uh, uh I think it's a DD 72. 1972 and it's the kill boxes have been in existence for a long time and so what it is is you use a four point grid system and you set this you you uh you, it's a you picture a box and then you make several boxes depending on how you need them within that box is a kill zone now you you know yourself that you may have enemy in that area. That kill box is like a free zone. And when you come in, uh, or that when that aircraft comes in, he knows he knows those grids. And if you say, "Hey, can you hit kill box so and so?" They'll come in. They'll they'll know the grids because they'll have them plugged in, and then they'll negotiate those targets there, which happened for us. Um, we were very successful and we put them in place again on the West side, because as we were moving through the, the Daria Suv Valley um, going westerly, and then we made our way up on the bulk Valley northerly, we had to have something protect us on the West. And so we set up the kill boxes and um, yeah, we, 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 we had a few calls on that, which was, uh, Hey man, I got, I remember one, I, I got four, I got four, um, land cruisers. They're loaded up. Um, Dishka's on the mounted on the, the, uh, the back of the bed. Uh, there seems to be 15 guys riding in this thing. Is that, is that bad or good? <laughs> <laughs> and the answer from us is, well, we're all on horses. So take them out. <laughs> uh, God. And they were, they were, they were very successful and they, they protected our flank and we were able to move in position to prepare and to go into uh Mazar Sharif. So I got to say, Bob, well, I could literally spend three hours talking <laughs> to you. So I'm going to pause here sure. the, for the frustration to the frustration of everyone listening because you do have swords of lightning coming out. We want to talk just a little bit about what you're doing today. Yes. And maybe one day you'll let me do a part two where we can dig into what sure. happens afterwards. Sure. I didn't realize we talked this long, but you know. uh, yeah, no, I mean, I'm telling you like this, I, I just remember being back in college thinking, God, I would give anything to be in that team right now. Even going through like the CIA museum when I was working there, like yeah. seeing some of the original artifacts that the the agency guys were doing on the ground and pictures yeah. of you guys there. Love yeah, that. you saw the picture, right? Oh my God. Like yeah. I couldn't get enough of that. Like I just go down there on my lunch break some days to just look at that stuff. It was awesome. I, I tell you what, that that mission was the pinnacle of my career. It, it really was. And it was um and I I've had another one that was pretty good, but that was the that is what every special forces has to be dream to be. dreams of. He dreams of going into an area on his own, the 12 man ODA, fighting with indigenous troops or militia to defeat bad people mm-hmm. from being oppressed. It's, a, it's amazing. It gives me goosebumps just hearing it, man. 
Love it. So, so look, let's, let's just talk briefly on what you got going now. So by the time this episode comes out, you will have released Swords of Lightning, which you co-wrote with some of the folks you just talked about, right? That's correct. Mark, uh, Mark Nooch, the commander, and Jim DeFelice, who is the author of uh, American Sniper. That's awesome. He Another wrote, fantastic uh, book. Oh, he wrote Omar Bradley. He wrote one, another bestseller, whatever it took. Uh, fantastic books. And so um, great guy. And we, I've enjoyed just knowing him, to be honest. Where, where did the idea for the book come from? Obviously, we've got the movie 12 Strong, but yeah. certainly you didn't have to write it. Like, where did, did you and, and the folks just decide, hey, we got to do this? Well, Mark and I had discussed it before after Horse Soldier came out. And then, of course, they turned, they changed the name of that book to 12 Strong because of the movie. But we wanted the book, we wanted a story to be told more about 595, the guys and, and what they what they dealt with, uh, the obstacles that we encountered and, and how we adapted to the, 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 the changing the ever-changing uh, battlefield. And so it was something that um, we we talked about for a couple of years, and finally we said, you know, look, we need to write this book. And uh, to be honest with you, we started this over five years ago. And um, I asked Jim, I said, well, how long does it normally take to write a book for you? He goes, yeah, about a year, Bob. <laughs> so what happened is, is, as we started and we were gathering as much information because we wanted to be as accurate as we possibly can, it began to mostly take over, take over us, especially Mark. And because he had been dealing with uh, uh, the some of the Afghans there and helping some of the interpreters there. And so it, the, the emotions overtook him and it, it slowed the uh, progress of the book. Um, you know, I, I remember, I remember talking to him one day and, uh, it, Jim was on the phone and he goes, um, I said, look, we, we got to get this book done. He goes, well, you know, and he had lost track of time. And I said, well, it's been a while. He said, well, yeah, what, six months. And I said, um, no, it's been two and a half years. Just got so deep in it basically. Yeah. And we had basically at that point almost finished it anyway. <laughs> yeah he goes and then jim jim jumped in and he goes yeah it's been that long bar and uh, but i understand i understand how it you know like i said you know as we talked earlier sometimes the emotions come out of me it just hit mark a little harder and so um you know we 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 gathered our not our senses, but our emotions and, 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 and completed the book. Um, but it was, um, it's a fast read. It is incredibly fast. Um, it's amazing that you will fly through it and you'll probably pick up things that you and I just talked about and you go, Holy crap. And the next thing you know, you're done. Yeah. I, I know. It's, I love uh, it. That, and that's exactly what happened to me. I, I was reading it and then, I'd like to read this again. So, yeah. Um, how about horse soldier bourbon? Where did that come from? How, how did you end up uh, being being a part of that? Well, the bourbon itself was a, a brainchild of uh, John Coco, who's the CEO of Horse Soldier Bourbon, and um, and Scotty Neal, and um, they were. They were roaming around Wyoming and, uh, you know, on a uh, vacation, basically. And uh, Scotty didn't have a job at that time. He, he just stopped working for the Green Beret Foundation. And um, Coco had, uh, you know, he, he had uh, an insurance company at that time. And so, but he was taking vacation. And so, and, and uh, Elizabeth, Coco's wife was, was there as well. And they were, they were out there riding around on horses and taking their time, you know, and just relaxing, fishing. And they hit these distilleries on the way 
back and they just started, you know, trying all these distilleries, vodka distilleries and, and, and thinking, you know, this is kind of cool. Maybe we should, you know, maybe we should do this. Maybe we should uh, start a distillery. And Scotty goes, you know, I, I need a job anyways. I need to do something. And uh, so they started the process and then they brought in, they brought in Mark and I. And um, because, of course, you know, the horse filter theme. And, uh, and at this time, we still didn't even know the name of the bourbon. And this was back in 2015. And so we're, <laughs> I remember the calls of, we we're all in the calls coming up with these names. And we finally pinpointed the name and said, you know, Horse Soldier, the, the America's Response Monument in New York City. Let's, let's call it that. We all, you know, it was like, yeah. And then, of course, Elizabeth, Elizabeth goes, I got an idea for a label. You know, we could put that and put it on the label and make it all pretty. She had, she had done work, uh, extensive work with uh, perfumes and uh, oh, perfect. I had a, yeah, I know. Thriving business with that, and uh, so she had come up with a, a lot of the design work, and um, and we had come up with little things here and there, but um, that's basically how it got started, and uh, it's taken off like wildfire our, our first our first year we sold 4,000 cases um, then uh, and then it just kind of creeped up last year we did over 60,000 cases uh, we're not we're not considered craft anymore this year we plan on selling a hundred thousand cases um, so I, I think uh, I think that'll be accomplished heck yeah wow yeah there's a lot of bourbon drinkers out there <laughs> so it's and that that is good too my family lives in tampa uh the tampa st pete area they've always yes. got a they've always yeah. got a bottle there they just yeah. and a lot of veterans in my family anyway so it's just so such I, a cool story so i've had I, it it's great it's great you, like i've had it and you've been to this you've been to st pete right or the, the i've not been to the distillery i think i'm oh, i'm coming yeah. down to see y'all for Suffolk this weekend and hopefully i'll get to see that place with my own two eyes Nice. And we, we just uh, broke ground at Somerset, Kentucky. And oh, nice. Yes. And we've been accepted on the bourbon trail and you have to be accepted on the bourbon trail. And uh, we have our bourbon actually in the Fraser house. So if you ever go into Louisville, which is part of that, you know, running around there uh, in, the, in the bourbon trail, the Fraser house displays uh, bourbons from all of uh, all of the, uh, uh, the, the bourbons that are on the trail and they have a little write up about them. And so they we're, we're there now. And so it, um, I'm looking forward to the distillery being built, uh, should be in about three and a half years. Uh, the, the distillery itself and the, um, and the rick houses will go up first. And then the rest of it will be put into place. There's a there will be an inn there. There's a chapel cool. there. We'll we'll put some artifacts of uh, our time in the the service. Um, you know, Coco was a Green Beret and a Ranger. Uh, uh, of course, Scotty Neal was in First Battalion. His one of his teams is the team I took up on the river. Um, and while we were while we you know while we were doing our action up in. Uh, up north of the horses, his guys are, and himself were running down south, coming in on helicopters in the night, sneaking and peeking, awesome. grabbing, grabbing lieutenants and taking them, just, <laughs> just taking them out. And the next morning, you can see Al Qaeda wake up and go, "Hey, where's our commander? <laughs> there's a jo there's a job opening here." <laughs> yeah. Hey, uh, we need somebody else to fill the shoes here. Anybody Who else? wants it? Uh, I don't know now. <laughs> so, yeah, so it's, uh, I think it'll be unique and very cool. Yeah. Everyone, you know, every, every bourbon company has a story. We like to say we have history. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I was thinking like, yeah, they accepted you onto the trail. How could you not accept this story onto that trail? So that That's makes right. total sense. Um, Bob, there's two questions I ask everybody before I let you go, if you don't uh -huh. mind. One uh -huh. is, 
Was there anything that you carried with you into combat that you felt had sentimental value, a good luck charm, or that you just really needed to have on you? Two things. I actually, I, I, uh, my sons went to Fort Campbell High School. They played sports there. They loved it there. I'm from Fort Campbell. So I, there's a picture, and I'm going to give it to the museum at uh, the John F. Kennedy Museum in uh, Fort Bragg. I wore a Fort Campbell baseball cap. And like I wore a high school team. A high school team. Cool. I wore that most of the time. And then the other thing was I had my coin that my wife gave me that I kept on me. And those were really the, the two things that uh, coin? a special forces coin, which I still carry. She 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 bought it for me when I graduated the Q course. And figure I graduated in 90. And I still have that coin in my wallet to this day. That's cool. Um, last question here. Oh, I'm oh, yeah. sorry. You there, is a, there is a third thing. Wow. I just thought of this. I went to my brother's wedding. And when I was going to go into the Gulf War, um, an old Vietnam vet came up to me and he handed me a, a, uh, um, uh, what is it? Uh, Viet, Vietnam money. And he said, uh, for some reason, this gave me luck. He said, I want you to take it with you. And I said, okay. And I had that since 90 as well. And that's, that's still, awesome. Still in my wallet. And it is crumbling to pieces right now. That is great. I love that one. And I think, did I read this correctly, that the team flew over there with a piece of the World Trade Center? We did not. Not you got. Okay, maybe. 595 did not um, because we were the one of the first teams in. The, some of the, the uh, following teams came in and they, they brought some. It was too soon for you guys. Yeah. yeah. And then the, the last question I ask everybody, I think I know the answer for you, but I still like to ask it just looking back on this time that you spent, I mean, you've been in combat since like 1990, basically 1991. Right. Um, all, all the time you spent away from your family, as we just talked about the, the people you may have lost along the way, times you've been in harm's way, would you go back and do all that again? Absolutely. And you know, it's, it's funny because I sat in the, 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 the dentist chair, which I hate terribly. <laughs> And the, um, the assistant was, you know, cleaning my teeth and uh, hygienist was cleaning my teeth. And she looked at me, she, she started hearing the, the story. She goes, Hey, the, the, the dentist knows about you and blah, blah, blah. I started, I go, yeah, we're, we're good friends. And uh, she goes, well, was it worth it? And I looked at her and went, was it worth it? I said, hell yeah, I do it all over again. I said, the, the thing I miss the most is the camaraderie. I, I hey, miss man. the guys. Yeah. I miss the, 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 the family, the closeness of what we did together. There are more brothers than really my own brothers just because of what we went through all those times. Love it. That is perfect. Thanks so much for the time, Bob. This is great. I know hopefully I'll get to see you here in Tampa shortly. Sure. And maybe we got a round two in us one day to, yeah, you know, we got years of combat that we haven't even scratched the surface of. So thanks so much yeah. for sharing all this, for writing the book, um, doing what you do with the, with the whiskey and, and speaking to vets and connecting them. So that's awesome. Thanks. Yep. Yep. I appreciate it. And I'm sorry I went too long on some things, but no, some of those things, I think it helped clarify or clarify some of, the, the actions that took place. Absolutely. Yeah. That was a great blast. Thanks so much, Bob. Thanks, Ryan. I appreciate it, man. Thanks for having me. Thanks for listening to this combat story. I have a request for our listeners to spread the word about our Trust and Safety Institute and help us connect those who served with meaningful and great paying jobs after service. You've heard me and dozens of our guests talk about how difficult the transition is from service in the military and government to the private sector. Most of us, myself included, fail because we don't find a role that's fulfilling and pays the bills. I was fortunate enough to be recruited by Google into the trust and safety industry. 
I'd never heard of this industry before, but it's the perfect private sector role for those of us who want to keep helping people while taking the fight to bad actors. In trust and safety, much like I experienced in the military and CIA, you'll find yourself protecting people, but on the scale of billions and on huge platforms like YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, and hundreds more. You'll be fighting nation state threat actors pushing misinformation, terrorists trying to recruit online, pedophiles exploiting children, fraudsters scamming vulnerable groups, and more. You'll be in big tech getting paid a big tech salary, but best of all, you do not need to know how to code for this. And unfortunately, there's no training program for trust and safety, so we created one. It's called the Trust and Safety Institute. And if you want to get a job in this lucrative industry, check out our website at trustsafetyinstitute.com, also linked in the description, where we have a daily newsletter with everything important you need to know in the industry, daily job postings, and training courses to get you up to speed. We designed this for transitioning military, government, and law enforcement so that they can avoid the mistakes that many of us made, but it will be equally appealing for those who just want a job with more meaning and great pay. We want to give those transitioning the best opportunity possible, so we made it free for those with a .mil or .gov email address. Our Trust and Safety Institute is not a resource for just current or former service members, however. If you want a better paying job and more meaningful work in a rapidly growing industry, this will be a great resource to check out. So if I can ask one favor of our listeners, please share our website, trustsafetyinstitute.com, and this information for those that you know who are looking for a positive career change. Thanks. Our first comment is from YouTube on the Bill Ostland interview, and it's from Ed D. He says, all right, Fugit, I'll give you this. You do some great interviews with some real heroes. Just in the last week or so, I've been watching them, and I think you are my go-to now. I guess I'll have to back up and watch your story now. Ha <laughs> ha. Thanks. Ed, I just want to say thanks for that. You will be sadly disappointed in listening to my story compared to some of these uh, door kickers and heroes. But um, yeah, it's got some fun moments in it. So hope uh, hope it doesn't disappoint too much. But thanks very much for the kind words. It means a lot. And our second comment is also from YouTube on the Patrick Kinsella episode. And it's from Through the Muck and the Mire. It says, I appreciate the ECP comment in here. I was National Guard ECP uh, mounted patrols in Herat, Afghanistan. Sometimes it feels like I didn't do anything over there because I was because <clears throat> I wasn't kicking down doors. But looking back, it really was dangerous, as you know what, given what we did. And it's so true. I picked this specific comment because I think so many of us were not the um, the special ops door kickers. But everything we went through was very dangerous, for sure, and necessary to uh, basically set the conditions so people like Patrick uh, and Shrek could go in at night and do what they did best. So thanks for leaving that comment. It's a great one. Um, I think it speaks to a lot of us out there. So thanks. And then lastly, just before we go, for those of you who are not yet on our Patreon page, we'll have an exclusive outtake from our interview with Bob that you can hear over at www.patreon.com slash combat story. Thanks everyone. Stay safe.